everybody, and welcome to Publish Me, Punish Me, a comedy series that's examining deal practices within the games industry with me, Ava Carr, founder and CEO at Glitch, and me, Sun M, studio director of Perfect Garbage. Each episode will dive into indie publishers, crowdfunding, equity deals, and more. So whether it's the good, the bad, or just plain yikes, we're going to tackle it all. If you're interested in discussions about the design and business of video games, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel below. We're tackling equity today. Yeah, equity uh. and shares. I know that we recently, I say recently because these are all recorded in in interesting times stop so the magic. <laughs> yes there's magic here son you do not tell the listeners you do not lift the veil Listen, the listeners respect the man behind the curtain okay <laughs> they wave to him and he waves back and he tips his hat listen and that me. man is alana that's me <laughs> the man is alana. <laughs> but uh we've spoken about equity before um we've kind of uh talked about it and what it means in the game dev space but it would be really cool to do a quick recap Equity is exchanging shares of a company and or studio with funding and or financing. So uh, let's talk Shark Tank. So on Shark Tank, what they'll do is, you know, people will come out and they'll say, hi, I'm here to raise $100,000 for 10% in my company, which really means and that math, that little math that they do is they just take 100,000 and multiply that by 10%. And then you'll know what the valuation is for that company. In my opinion, a lot of what comes down to the negotiation is uh, circling around those three numbers and what they each mean. In the games industry, we often talk about more project revenue splits as opposed to equity deals. It's mm. actually not super, super common unless you're going with VCs or angel investors or other forms of backend funding, as opposed to publishers and platforms that we've talked about previously. So getting an equity deal feels different when you do it in the game space. It definitely does, but I actually wanted, okay, I don't know if we should even do this right now, but I really want to share how common it is for people to receive equity, but people don't seem to talk about equity very much. There's a part of me that wants to do this exercise, introducing the games industry to crunchbase.com. And this is not a paid advertisement. This is literally a thing that I use uh, when I was starting to uh, think about raising equity for Glitch, because it is actually very common for not only game development studios, but also publishers to raise equity financing and is much more common than we even think. People just don't seem to talk about it. Why is it such a dirty secret? I really don't know. Do you want to throw out a couple of companies? Yeah. And, uh, I would love and or to... publishers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm going to say that this is publicly available knowledge. Um, Crunchbase is just this website that aggregates all of this information. And also something that's really important is I do have a Crunchbase Pro account personally, because again, I was looking at all of this information from uh, when we were looking at raising equity financing. Let's uh, look at Telltale Games. Okay, so Telltale, they went up to Series D in financing, which means they got pretty far along. What that actually means is when you're raising equity, oftentimes you there there's like a progression. You raise a seed round and or, well, you raise a friends and family round usually, and then you raise a seed round and then you go on to raise a Series A or a Series B or a Series C. And eventually the goal is that you will either get acquired by a company or you go public. Um, that is what has traditionally been seen in equity. They raised an initial round like that seed round, they had one investor mm -hmm. that went in at $1.4 million. And that was back in 2006. So these numbers are pretty wild, uh, 2006 numbers. In 2007, Series B was raised from two investors at a total of $6 million. And then they raised a Series C with two additional investors for $7 million. And finally, they raised a Series D from two additional investors in the total amount of $40 million. So if we add all of that up, we are sitting at 54.4. 54.4 four mil especially when you mentioned like the time now that now that i understand when you're talking about time wise that's substantial investors <laughs> call me <laughs> i'm happy to raise a round of 40 million <laughs> reminder they were also working on a lot of IP. big ips mm -hmm. they were working on a ton of big ip 
And so I think that exercise really is just kind of like, hey, it is actually pretty common. For some reason, we just don't talk about it. And that's, uh, I've, I hope we talk about it more. I agree. I think when we think equity, we can't, we don't think small studios can do this or non-veterans can do this, which I'm sure we're going to talk about some examples. It's definitely food for thought. Like, um, it's no surprise, like Perfect Garbage has done equity deals before. Um, I know quite a few other indie studios who have done it as well. And like you mentioned, I do think that hopefully the conversation brings it to like a more possible thing. Or at least people are more aware of what's currently out there. Well, we have some deals today. Who yes, wants to go first? Do you have a good one? Do you have a bad one? First of all, we should use the terms we've worked hard to establish. Am I going to punish you? Please no. No, mine is a uh, mine is definitely it's a it's a gonna journey. be a journey. It's fine. Yes. It's do you want me journey. to go first or do you want to go first? Yes, you go first. What's important about the deal that I want to talk about is that it is a different approach to equity funding in a way that isn't actually what we've been discussing. It's a it's a little bit different. There was an indie studio who's been really working hard to get their first game out. When they first formed, they had no real base money to start with. Mm -hmm. A lot of studios that we've talked about had some savings that they put into it. So they start the studio off or um, applied for grants, applied for funding. It it costs money to kick a studio off the ground. Right? It costs money to make games. I wish more people understood this. Uh, The studio really wanted to make uh, certain games. None of these members of the studio were programmers. And as you know, programmers are a valuable asset in games. Sometimes you can get away without. I'm not saying you can't do it. There's some great games that actually aren't, you know what I mean? They really wanted to have a programmer for the type of game that they were making. They really wanted to build from the ground up. So we need a programmer. But all of us are doing this on our side. Hustle, we don't really have an income for it. We don't even have the money to support that. How do we get someone to join our team and believe in us with nothing to show for it at the start? They told me they went on Reddit, they went on Tumblr, they went on all everywhere, over, all over the internet um, and proposed what their studio was about, what they're hoping to form. Uh, none of them were veterans and a program di- programmer did reach out. This is a two part story. First programmer that reached out offered an equity deal as an option instead of, you know, being paid a certain amount that they might have regularly been paid. Uh, they wanted a stake in the studio. Uh, Mm -hmm. Basically, what that means is every time the studio made profit, when they pull from that profit and they split as a dividend, that programmer would be paid. Seems like a valuable and, of course, great idea, except at the time, the programmer was asking for a really high amount of equity. And they actually told me they almost took this deal because they didn't know the value of shares or what that means as a studio. They were asking for 48. What? Right. How many people were in the studio? Four. Yes. Now, like I said, if you don't know what equity is or stakes or shares or things like that, you might not understand what that number is your first time around. We joked, but I was really new to equity uh, funding not too long ago. Alana learned about equity funding during this show. It's, it's, it's like you said, not really talked about. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So they actually debated it. It was only after getting consult from a few of the studios that they ended up deciding hey, we really want to make games for the foreseeable future. And this programmer might not stick around with us for every game that we make. Giving 48% of our company to this programmer might be a bad idea. (laughs) Instead, they uh, declined the offer and they continued their search and actually ended up meeting a second programmer. And this second programmer, they talked it out, they made a deal. And the second programmer actually asked for 12% equity. Um, What was great was that they were already building a similar structure with the four other members. In which case, I would like to present you the accidental (laughs) co-op. It's not a full co-op, but what they agreed to the terms was the programmer would make a certain amount of flat fee just based on the resources that they had, and in turn, receive that amount of equity. And once they were able to get funding, raise that pay to match, but the equity wouldn't change. Before I tell you how this ended up, how do you feel, Ava, of giving up equity to hire somebody kind of, I don't want to say at a lower rate, but at a rate that your studio can afford with the promise of better payment upon success. Indie studios always have to kind of bargain with each other when they're starting out at that low level. So it's not an uncommon thing, but how do you feel about I mean, when we started, it was always an exchange of services. Uh, We we also started talking a little bit about equity, but I I was pretty shy on that end uh, early on just because I didn't know where exactly I wanted it to go yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have more questions than I have thoughts. Uh, So is this... Is this person essentially 
you know, a, a co-owner, like they're going to be in this the same amount that the original person was going to be like, let's say 20 hours and 20 hours, or, you know, like, what does that look like? And did they have an established relationship beforehand? They've never worked with them before. They found each okay. other through online and they had the same taste in games at the time. Like I said, this was a new studio. They barely understood what equity was. So they didn't mm-hmm. really have like a, here's what's required of you to receive this equity or yeah. things like that. But if you don't know like your way around that system, you are always going to be confronted with, I don't want to say the losing end, but the more vulnerable, we need you. Here's what we can do. I don't think I have enough information. I, oh, no. okay, that's fair. No, no, I, no, no, I don't think I have enough information because I, I, at this point in time, these are the questions that are definitely going through my head, right? Will this person be around? What, what does it look like? Are they, do they have shared goals and shared values? Can we talk about that in advance? What is their what is their role and capacity, especially on the business side? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I oftentimes think that some of the greatest teams have a, a, a CEO type um, and also a creative director type. Um, so someone is specifically handling uh, a good handful or at least leading the conversation on business and the other person leading the conversation on uh, the creation of the games. I, it just comes down to like, what do those conversations turn out like? I guess then you're, there is no publish me or punish me option for you this round. It actually has a lot to do with um, who the other person is and trying to understand okay. if our goals actually align. So, and and if it, if they don't, then then that's okay. But figuring out a way to help us get aligned. Yeah, it's super important to understand who you're working with. I would say publish me if equity is equal, the amount of time is equal. Uh, And also the vision is shared between both teams and there are options or conversations around what will happen if we at some point don't align on any of those, Mm -hmm. uh, what are the potential outcomes? So I would say publish me on that scenario and I would say punish me if in any of those cases, as you're talking about those things, you recognize like, oh, oh, shit, I don't want to actually work with this person. Never mind. Right. Like if you have those hard conversations and you recognize that you're not aligned on a, on at least even like one of those, um, then absolutely not. I think this was a publish me deal because Mm. that programmer ended up being such a core member of the team. They handle management, just like the rest of the members. They've been with the studio for over five years at this point. The person that was talking to me, the studio director said that they couldn't imagine being the studio that they are now without this person. Really on their cute. board um so in the end it was a risk like ava mentioned they listed all the uh possible mm-hmm, <laughs> possible mm-hmm. goods and bads of this type of relationship but equity was shared across the board everyone felt like it was a very equitable decision they've definitely been involved in the studio since then um it's their full-time job it's all of their full-time jobs and they it's really sweet they've done it together yeah it's a really wholesome because like you said equity can be a dangerous game if you are all like, is yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they ended up really coming through and they, they evolved together. So a lot of the things that you mentioned, the terms between them, how do they remove contracts? They've actually worked to build that as a together, um, into a place where they're all really happy. Um, so the studio is doing great. Now tell me Uh, about you. What do you? Mine is not so sweet. Brace yourselves. It's time for me to bring you the pain, son. I love being hurt. (laughs) Winks. The line that stood out to me was they had said, we sold off too much too early. We're a new studio with big ambitions and knew that we needed funding to get it off the ground. Think AAA. So they wanted to make like a really big studio. They wanted a lot. So they said, myself and the team decided to raise an initial seed round of $500,000 from early stage angels. They know their stuff too. Like they're like, Mm -hmm. not in my sphere. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 but they, they, they clearly like understand how much they kind of need it. And I was gonna say, are they vets? Like they've been in the AAA space, right? Gotcha. Like these are ex AAA people who have been in the AAA space. <laughs> they at least had some, some conversations clearly with some people who knew something. So we were using that to build out a prototype and also to set up a Kickstarter in order to build an audience, plus also show a proof of concept. So our goal was to sign a platform deal to land a better valuation for the follow-up series 
a raise. So there's a lot to unpack here. So they raised $500,000 from Mm -hmm. early stage angels. They decided that they wanted to use that money to do a Kickstarter so that they can build an audience and also have essentially what is their prototype. And then from that prototype, they wanted to sign platform deals so that they could then chain that into a better valuation for their series A raise. So they already knew that they wanted to raise an additional round of capital. Your red flags. Talk to me. Running a Kickstarter, even as a AAA for a prototype is a big danger. I have seen AAA studios do that too and end in fire. In my personal opinion, you never want to take investment from public that early on um, in your studio because then your studio is not allowed to fail uh, Mm. or make mistakes. Your studio is under an intense scrutiny of the public. And if you're promoting yourself as a AAA studio with a Kickstarter and the the, like audience is watching you promote yourself in this way, like there's nothing more than fans of games likes to do than to stock. Like, I I don't know. It, it sends all of my red flags off. As you know, my personal experience in trying to raise money post a yeah. Kickstarter, it can act as a deterrent um, much, much more than a swaying point. So I, uh, I'm always like, oh, that was a really bold idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope they raised enough from the Kickstarter because I feel like that might also affect the evaluation of what Mm -hmm. they're looking for. So continuing on the story, they said, although our early stage funders were phenomenal, they did a lot of work by helping to recruit some essential staff, putting us in contact with also publishers and also platforms and so much more. What they realized was that they had sold off too much of the studio too early at 40%. So for 500,000, they sold 40%. Yeah. Yeah. That's rough. That means the company's so I, valued at a little bit more than a mil. 1.25. Wow. They didn't have anything from my understanding, right? Yeah, like they yeah. didn't have anything at the beginning. They didn't have staff. They didn't have literally anything. No prototype, no audience, no nothing. Mm-hmm. But their goal was to be a big AAA studio. This made it super hard for them to lose any more equity in future rounds since they would be putting their majority stake at risk. They didn't talk very much and didn't share very much about the Kickstarter. So they said, looking back as the leader of the studio, I wish I would have planned more ahead when thinking about future funding and also reduce the amount of dollars we raised early on to keep a few more available for later rounds. And I'm assuming that more is more equity uh, to available for later rounds. So they said, for now, we've started moving forward with additional project-based financing, and we'll start to think about selling IP or a percentage of IP instead and hopes for some sort of hit so that we can buy back some of our shares that we sold before raising a series A. So this is very like, yeah, it's a little messy, but it always is right. It's never that clean. It's also never that linear. I don't think that was that bad. It's rough. Mm -hmm. It's the whole studio that you've built and you can't just throw it away and be like new time, new game time. Yeah. (laughs) One of the things that I started thinking of was like, how did they arrive at 40%? It's unfortunate that they couldn't manage or couldn't figure out exactly the right number for them. And it seems like this might have been like their first time doing the raise. So they they learned quite a lot, but there was like a small bit that was missing of like that that valuation piece and how like the value of how many people coming in versus how the timing of mm-hmm. you know uh, how much money and when and so I really appreciate that they shared this story because of the fact that timing is a big thing and the amount of money that you're asking for uh, is also another really big thing so even though it's not that bad it is your company yeah it's um, your baby and then yeah. yeah and now like you said they're now working on backtracking how do we buy back yeah. Uh, okay. And if, if they are successful, let's say in their Kickstarter and things like that, that means their valuations has jumped. There's more levers, right? And there, there's more ifs, in my opinion, in this scenario. Son, I should have even in telling this story, would you have done publish me or punish me before knowing 500,000 at 40%, which means 1.25 valuation? Um, if they were all vets. And they all had the ability to make a game like to completion. It was just a funding. It sounded like mostly like a funding uh, thing, as well as, you know, some investors have required access to new staff and things like that. 
Um, the answer is no. Um, the way I would have done it, I am no genius at this. So, you know, this could be wrong is I would have actually taken individual folks' experiences and values and then conducted my evaluation based on set experiences and values that they add to the company. If they had sway, you know, maybe they wrote one of the biggest games that was out a few years ago. Yeah. Um, you could argue that single person alone has a certain evaluation of maybe a mill. Uh, and then with the rest of the studio, you can kind of build an evaluation that I think would help raise higher. I understand needing to raise that certain amount to get off the ground. Like I've been in that boat, hence why I kickstarted also. Uh, <sighs> but I would have kickstarted first. I would have, I, ooh, but then they couldn't afford the prototype. That's like, it's, oh, it's a vicious, it's an Ouroboros. <laughs> no, the answer is no. For 500, uh, for 500,000 for 40% is too high for me. I would have done a hundred thousand for however the equivalent of a keep it at 1.25 million fine, but just start at a way lower amount and build from there. Yeah. I keep wondering and, and going back, like, could you make a prototype of say like an MMO for a hundred grand? Like you don't know the scope of the game. I until- feel like first game, they should have started small then. Like they should have done a really high quality, almost triple A style Mm-hmm. 10 hour game that like yeah. they can prove they can do from start to finish you know we don't know the circumstances like you said we have, have no been, clue might have been in a very tight situation it might have been yeah. like that was a plan all along might have been like the kickstarter was a success or there's so many aspects that like we'll never know but uh you're saying no on 500k oh at yeah 40 punish me punish me <laughs> <laughs> punish me punish me hard <laughs> No, thanks. I think I would have done the same. I I wouldn't have taken this one either because uh, that's just simply too much too early. And I am in the same boat as you, son. I prefer doing, I I prefer shipping more consistently, right? Like that is my whole style is I prefer to ship more consistently. I think I would prefer to increase my odds and take a lower amount so that I can keep essentially personally I would rather keep a little bit more control and give myself some flexibility to move so uh thank you for that person for sharing hopefully it's a banger maybe you can buy back your shares who knows you can buy back your shares because that would be such a great you know like underdog like overcoming the circumstance story so yeah good luck to you mate and with that, that's uh, we're coming up to the end of the show. Thank you, wonderful people, for joining us for an episode of Punish Me, Punish Me. I hope you learned something and enjoyed the ride. It was a bumpy one, especially near the end. Um, if you have a past deal that you want us to discuss, click the Google form below and send it our way. It's all anonymous. Wait, I have a line yeah, after this. Do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed the show. And you can also continue the conversation with us over at discord.gg backslash Hayglitch. We'll see you next time. Ow. This finger, guys. <laughs> <laughs>